Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Brown, and welcome to this faculty forum on digital publishing. My name is Allison Levy. I'm digital scholarship editor at the Brown Library, and I'm joined today by Professor Shahzad Bashir, uh, who is Professor uh, Aga Khan, Professor of Islamic Humanities here at Brown and Professor of History and Religious Studies. He's also the author of a new future, uh, excuse me, a new vision for Islamic pasts and futures, one of our uh, groundbreaking digital publications that we'll be previewing for you today. That work is forthcoming with the MIT Press next fall. But first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about digital publishing here at Brown. The Digital Publications Initiative is a collaboration between the University Library and the Office of the Dean of the Faculty. It was generally launched with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in 2015. The initiative promotes innovative faculty scholarship by catalyzing both the practice and the academic recognition of new scholarly forms. Taking full advantage of the digital environment to advance scholarly arguments in ways that could never be accomplished in a conventional book whether through multimedia enhancements or innovative navigation uh, systems, Brown's multimodal born digital works uh, create exciting new conditions for the production and the sharing of knowledge. We partner with leading scholarly publishers to ensure that these groundbreaking works by our humanities faculty uh, are validated via rigorous peer review and disseminated to the broadest possible audience for the greatest possible impact. A new grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities will establish a training institute for scholars from a variety of institutions, uh, disciplines, and backgrounds who wish to develop innovative born digital scholarship but lack the capacity and resources at their home institution. And that uh, institute will run here on campus next summer. Brown's initiative is widely recognized as accessible, intentional, and inclusive. And we include students in all aspects of project development, allowing undergraduates and graduate students uh, the opportunity to learn from faculty authors, from digital humanities librarians, from digital technologists, and designers. And of course, we learn so much from the students. They are critical to the work that we do in the library. So in sum, Brown's Digital Publications Initiative is helping to set the standards for the future of scholarship in the digital age. We currently have 11 projects in our portfolio. Uh, the first, Furnace and Fugue, was published uh, last summer by the University of Virginia Press. We have two projects forthcoming, uh, Professor Bashir's work with MIT and a work coming uh, out with Stanford University Press uh, on virtual realities by Professor Massimo Riva. Uh, we have eight other projects that are in various stages of development. We support authors at all career levels. Uh, and this slide highlights uh, several of our early career faculty who are participating in the initiative. Uh, and also a visiting professor, Renee Ader, an expert on uh, monuments to slavery, who chose to spend time with us here at Brown precisely because of our um, expertise in digital publishing. Uh, and then the last two projects uh, on this list uh, are uh, new in-house publications um, that we've embarked upon in the last year. Uh, the first is a digital second edition of the Slavery and Justice Report, that landmark study that came out in 2006. We'll be releasing a revised and expanded edition next month, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, and we have developed a teaching edition for the first readings program. So the incoming classes uh, 2021 and 2020 uh, were assigned that, that reading in that digital format. So our students are engaging with, uh, with our digital publications, uh, not just as contributors to developing the work, but now as readers, as our primary audience in some cases. 
Uh, and we also have been working with the Center uh, for uh, the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America and the Provost's Office to develop a multi-volume uh, digital publication series that builds upon the, the very timely uh, and important panel discussion series on race in America that began last academic year and will continue through this year. Uh, so I think at this point, I want you to take a deeper dive into one of our digital publications, and of course that is Professor Bashir's work, so I will turn this podium over to Shazad. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison, for, um, for the overview. And thank you all for your patience in, in dealing with our technical issues. If there's enough computers around, one will eventually work. So here we are. <laughs> um, so it's, it's my pleasure to talk about this book, um, which uh, has been in, in development for a while. Uh, initially, I was writing this book entirely as a paper book. And then the opportunity was presented to make it into a digital publication. And it became very exciting to think about it because um, how to develop actually a specific interface that carries the argument of, of the work and not simply something that maps from, from print. So um, the process of this was fantastic, working with designers, engineers, with Allison as the editor, eventually with the MIT Press uh, to come up with um, what I will show. Now, uh, the, the intellectual impetus for this work is my dissatisfaction with what is considered to be Islamic history. The way Islamic history is understood academically at the moment uh, in the Western Academy but also all around the world is the notion that it began with the Prophet Muhammad and then it comes all the way to the present in different Muslim societies that we can document. And so there is presumed to be a kind of timeline on which we hang various uh, dynasties, various peoples and so on. Now, this particular form of Islamic history was actually invented only in the late 19th century and it continues to the present. So I want to explode this and um, to, to get away from the notion of a timeline, to actually think of Islamic history as a web of ideas and uh, objects and narratives and stories that have been spread all over the world that, that unite in a, in a web-like form. Um, they, they have intensive interconnectivity, but they, there's no straight lines. Time is actually something that human beings manufacture. So I want to see how Muslims and, and non-Muslims have thought about the Islamic past um, and created various versions of time. Um, now, to do this in narrative form, in print form, requires a lots and lots of narrative to explain, well, this happened, that happened. But what the web form does is because it allows one to actually show uh, things in a, in a web form. And that's what... Uh, what was the process of coming up with this specific interface. So when you go to the book, um, uh, when it will be published, you will see this, um, what you have on the cover. On the, so, so on the image side of it, um, this is a, an artwork by an Egyptian Lebanese artist um, called uh, The Grave of Time. So I'm using that and there's a discussion of this artwork, conceptual artwork in the book as well. But what happens, uh, the way the book works is when one uh, presses explore, it kind of explodes into these dots, which are all the different sections of different chapters. Um, so there is a visual table of contents, um, and there's some instructions that it provides as to what to do. And there's also, the book will have detailed instructions. There is a, uh, what looks like a regular table of contents of, to the book. So here are the seven chapters and different sections of the chapters. If one wants to read this book as one would read a print book, one can go through the sections uh, um, in sequence. So there is a logical narrative as to why the chapters are arranged the way they are and what is covered in them. But what the visual uh, d d table of contents does is it allows one to actually um, show you uh, that the, the, the different sections of the different chapters are actually spread across this web. If one presses on one or the other uh, chapter name, you can sort of see where the sections are. 
So, I will lock it on to chapter 4 for example, but when you go visually, so right uh, uh, to a, a section inside a chapter, you can see that there are, are other sections from other chapters that are actually interlinked with the chap with section in one chapter. So, the, so because what the, one of the major th uh, th advantages that is present in web publication um, is that we have multiple types of indexicality. So, essentially there are two different uh, table of contents that are working uh, within the book and the book can be read according to the plan I have, it can, it can be read um, visually um, by connecting to sections in other chapters and it can be read completely free form. Now, because of to make this possible required thinking about writing in a very different way. There are interconnections embedded between all chapters and it is up to the reader to actually constitute the book um, as, as they want. There is a kind of uh, free form play possibility that is built into it and this is directly connected to the argument of the, of the book that time is a human construct and the way we decide to actually put things in sequence to create duration and, curate and, and to create time completely changes the meaning of events. And so, the, 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 the design is actually performing out what the, what the argument is. Now, how does this happen? Uh, I will just take you to, uh, so the first section in chapter 4, which is chapter 4 is concerned with lifetime. So, it is concerned with stories of human lives in biography, autobiography, collections of biographies and so on. Thinking of the human life as, as, a, as, a, um, as a kind of unit of, of time and how do people create time by linking human lives. So, I in this, uh, this first section it is called a woman's voice. So, I focus on the work of um, uh, the Moroccan sociologist uh, Fatima Bernisi and here you have it in her uh, picture and these the images can be uh, enlarged um, and also one can look at them carefully um, in, in the in the inside the book. So, um, Fatima Bernisi was very concerned throughout her life she died in 2005, uh, 2015 sorry with the, the with women's empowerment and women's voices in Islamic uh, Islamic societies. And unlike most sociologists her argument was that the only way to change the future of Muslim societies is actually to change the past. You cannot act because the past has tremendous power in Islamic context. So, if we re-narrate the past that is the only way to produce new possibilities for the future. She, she was able to do this um, through writing her own um, uh, uh, rewriting her own autobiography in the city of Fez where she was born in Morocco and then using the life stories of many many other people. Um, um, she was also very interested in uh, kind of bringing out pasts that have other viabilities. So, here um, this is a cartoon that comes from a 1931 publication in, in Egypt where these are two feminists who are being chased by Egyptian politicians. So, there is a long history of feminist um, kind of activism uh, in Arab societies and Muslim societies that she was very concerned with. Um, here again you can sort of see the, the digital capability of being able to look very carefully at, at these types of images. She was interested in the pre-modern past. So, here is a for example, she has a long discussion of a, a queen uh, by the name of Razia Sultana who was a sovereign uh, in a Muslim sovereign in India in the 13th century and these are coins that were actually minted in, in her name as, as the sovereign. Um, um, so, ultimately what I do in this section is to, to excavate and to present the thought of Fatma Mernisi uh, both in her own context, but also what she wanted to do with the, with the Islamic past. And her big um, uh, concern was always was with, with women's voices and giving voice to, to female actors. Uh, so, this is just a mural that is from the city of Casablanca in, um, in, in, in Morocco, um, which again the, the presence of women has to be noted and made historically relevant uh, throughout. Now, um, if you look at the bottom of this, this the chapter is lifetimes and this is the first section. The other sections of this chapter go to very different parts of the world. They go to, um, to India, to uh, medieval Spain, to um, uh, stories of the enslaved Muslims in Americas, in Brazil and the United States um, and also to the birth of Indonesia as a nation in 1949. Um, so, what I try to do is to show how the life 
human life can actually be thematized in very different ways coming from Muslim context. But if we go, so there's one way to read it uh, through lifetimes, but if we then go to the, back to the, the visual table of contents, and here is chapter 4, here is woman's voice, we can go to sections that are uh, interrelated, but they're not in different chapters. So I'll go to this um, section called life stories. And here I'm interested in uh, looking at the life of a, a woman who's uh, recorded in history, in who in the story in the, in the historical sources in 1882 in the city of Esfahan in Iran, a young woman had um, acquired a, a very terrible disease of the eye. And as she was very bereft from this eye and, and the doctors basically said she was going to go blind, someone suggested that what she should do is to listen to the, the story of the pain of um, the Prophet Muhammad's uh, grandson Hussein when he died in the year 680. So she, she was asked to think about and actually um, interact with the story of Hussein's death 12 centuries before her, her own affliction. The idea being that by participating in that pain, her own pain would be diminished. So the historian says that she uh, was listening to this and as she was listening, she went into, she fell asleep. In the sleep, she had a dream in with, when the Prophet's uh, grandson Hussein came back to her and he uh, talked to her in the dream and touched her eyes. And when she woke up, she had been completely cured. So the past is a kind of remedy, the way the story is presented. Now beh behind this, uh, this is just a, an image of a, a, an album from from the same context where this story is coming from in 19th century Iran. These stories um, of the prophet's grandson's death, they are they're, uh, presented in narrative form, but also in pictorial form. There's a type of painting that is used in Iran called the coffee house painting, in which you can see this very complex painting in which the whole life and death of Hussein is represented. These, story, these paintings were used to tell the story of the prophet's, uh, the, the Hussein's death. And so the, this painting is reflecting the world within which the story of the woman's healing um, it, it comes out. Now this, um, this story of Hussein's death has remains tremendously relevant. So here is a poster that we can find on the website of um, Ayatollah Khamenei, the, the grand leader, the current grand leader of Iran, and, and where Hussein's death is this grand event that has something to teach all human beings. Um, and so what I'm trying to show with this is how a story is connected to these webs of, of, uh, of different types of meaning that are created in various, um, various Muslim contexts. Now, if we go back to um, the visual table of contents, go again to uh, chapter four, and here is the woman's, uh, woman's voice. This was, I just talked about life, uh, life stories. And if we go to events relived, which is in a different chapter, chapter one, there I take up the, the notion of the date of Hussein's death, which is the 10th of the first uh, month of the Islamic calendar, which is referred to as Ashura. Now this date is celebrated across the world in Muslim context in many different ways. So I want to show that, that the date is fixed, it happens every year and it repeats itself. What happens on that date around the world is radically different. So I take the reader through um, what happens in a city called Kudus, in Indonesia, where there's a celebration happens and there's no mention of Hussein at all. The date matters, but the meaning has been transposed to another descendant of the Prophet in this case. Um, in other places, uh, in Bahrain, for example, here you have an image of uh, redemptive suffering where people will hurt themselves in order to participate in, the, in, in, in what happened to Hussein and to, to really relive his pain. Uh, in Iran, uh, huge, um, uh, uh, processions are held in which there is a kind of um, uh, a coffin of Muhammad of Hussein that is presented and, and that is paraded through the streets. Um, similarly, this is from Kolkata in India, where again there are processions and Hussein's um, uh, horse that is uh, brought back to to kind of representation every year, and the procession actually relives the the death of Hussein. So the meanings and the, their interrelations, but the, each one of these cases actually presents a different, um, different world within which the meaning takes place. Um, I then uh, look at, this is a video of um, a group of three sisters that uh, recite um, uh, a stories, uh, poetry in Urdu, um, which is a North Indian Pakistani language. Uh, 
um, about the death of Hussein. There's a particular genre of poetry that is used. So we have the video of the, of the recitation and also a full translation. And the key thing in the poem that I chose for it is, is trying to understand the pain of the mothers of the people who were killed um, at the time of Hussein's death. Um, then we go further. Uh, uh, in the 19th century, large numbers of Indians from North India were transplanted to the Caribbean as indentured labor. They brought their worlds with them. And uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, there is a uh, festival that happens on the 10th of Muharram every year called Jose Trinidad. Um, this is an interesting thing because it's partly about Hussein and it partly it becomes um, actually a, a carnival, a, a Caribbean carnival. In this, all kinds of people participate, not just Muslims, but Muslims, Hindus, Christians. And there's a drumming contest, as you can see here. Um, there's also uh, uh, a procession in which these two moons are presented, one in red and green. These are uh, representations of the two grandsons of the Prophet who are celebrated in Trinidad in an entirely different uh, way. Uh, further, um, there are people who have come up with the idea that Hussein's blood can be commemorated by giving blood. Um, so there are organizations that hold uh, blood drives in that uh, time period, both a kind of bloodletting, a uh, very different way to think about bloodletting. But at the same time, it's, this day is also can be a day of great violence. Um, so this is a photograph of, um, uh, from Afghanistan, uh, where on the 10th of Muharram, a mosque, a Shia mosque is actually bombed. And this man is, um, is grieving at the, um, at, uh, at the grave of his daughter. Uh, so, so we have all these different meanings that are built into the, into the day. Another tradition that is there on the 10th of Muharram um, around the world is to share, um, share desserts. So in Turkey, there is a dessert called Ashure, which is the name of the day, um, in which uh, people cook this dessert and then share with each other. And the same dessert, similar desserts, named, desserts with similar names we can find all over the place, from Indonesia all the way to Morocco, that are named after that. But the desserts are doing many different things. So what I'm trying to show is that there are many types of times and histories that are built into uh, objects and food and all kinds of things that we can observe that we can use to create new types of um, Islamic histories. Um, and, and here, so we end up uh, just, a, just, a, just a diversity of it. And they're all interconnected. But this is, these are, there are no straight lines. Actually, we have many, many different ways of telling these, these stories. Ultimately, I'm just going to go to the concluding part. Um, actually, let me just uh, bring this up. So what I've shown you is materials from only three sections. There are 42 sections that go all over the world uh, and show all kinds of different things, uh, from films to images to narratives, uh, anywhere from the 8th century to the present to contemporary reality shows, for example, in which Islamic history becomes an interesting thing. My ultimate aim in all of this um, is kind of, I, I will just leave at this uh, quotation, is that history matters. Um, and the reason history, uh, the past actually matters, th so the way we uh, choose to tell the past is actually an ethical decision on our part. What I am trying to do with things Islamic here is actually not specific to Islam at all. One could take all, any kind, other kinds of uh, data, any other kind of connected uh, world in which one could do very, very similar types of things. Um, but it's which stories we decide to tell, um, it makes a huge difference. And the digital format, uh, because it makes it possible to actually show things um, and bring in various kinds of audiovisual materials and to show and to perform the kind of multiple uh, connectivity that is possible in, if we think about history as a web rather than a straight line, um, this is only possible in digital format. For, and this is the reason I'm immensely grateful to Allison and the digital publications and in the initiative at Brown to make it possible to reimagine things um, uh, in this way in humanities scholarship. Thank you. Thank you, Shazad. And uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Oh, yes. Um, my question Great. is, uh, have you looked at all at the digital things to try to integrate some of the, the digital concepts into physical objects and how you could navigate through that in a real space? Uh, 
so, so I think that's a step that we have to wait for, to first create this and then see uh, how, how it could possibly be done. I know actually that museums have tried to, and to do this as well also to actually enliven the objects that are there. So I think the, in, in a way, uh, this is the kind of the first step we are taking on creating the world. And then um, it's, it's, we hopefully look forward to actually taking the next steps to, to go into the internet of things actually, not, not just images. So, you know, hope or lived. Yeah, so it, it, we have tested it uh, with, uh, with people. Um, so, the, the, the hope very much is that it is so immersive that if once someone goes in, they will, they will uh, see the connections, et cetera. But as an author, my perspective on it is it's, it's not my job to try to control the reading experience. So, if, and because part of the issue is precisely to show that human history does not have specific trajectories. So I would be very happy if people take it and take it wherever they want. In the instructions, it says specifically that if you are reading this and if you look at an image and you get so sidetracked by it that you go off in your own directions, more power to you as far as I'm concerned. So I, it's, it's trying to actually build in that kind of freedom in, and, and that's what makes it a different type of academic writing than creating a contained uh, book that one would do. And that interactivity is, is again, a, a very unique affordance of digital, the digital expression of ideas. So we want to really harness that to give the reader's agency uh, to, to choose between the, the, the initial uh, uh, sort of constellation, that sort of abstract table of contents, or the more conventional table of contents for those readers who want uh, more guidance from the audience. But even within that conventional table of contents, you can dip in and out. Um, and we, we really want our readers, um, we imagine a, a, you know, a multiplicity of readers with, with di different preferences for reading, different learning styles, uh, and so we really do want to offer as many opportunities to explore the content sort of at their pace and according to their, their interests and preference. So th this is one of the wonderful things about digital publishing that we're able to, to carry forward. Yes, in the back, and then here. So how do I get this? <laughs> so a good question. No, so it, it's in the process of being copy edited, and, and f the design is finalized. It will be published in 2022, somewhere in the middle, and it will be published open access worldwide free, completely. So what you're saying is precisely the intent, so thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, and we should start to see um, the book promoted through the MIT Press website, uh, probably the January about, as soon as we move through the copy editing phase. But it is now um, in production with the press. So this is the final stage of several years of thinking and developing and innovating. So, so that's a fascinating question, a question that I've actually had to think about myself, looking at myself as from the outside. Um, I think where the, the initial really comes from teaching, because the teaching has radically changed over the past 15 years uh, in the classroom. And they're uh, finding these resources that have become available, that have become fairly normal. Carrying that into uh, academic prose and academic, an academic object like this was a huge learning experience. So what I had written about this book already had to be completely rewritten. Um, and working with the designers, because a lot of the time the designers came up with ideas that made me rethink how to actually present, what to say. Uh, a very different economies of, of the relationship between image and writing have to be done in this form as compared to regular writing. 
so I've been kind of gradually retraining myself to be able to uh, be able to do it. Yeah, and actually something that is uh, we are in the process of incorporating that will come up is that there will be actually a third way of dealing with all of this, which is there's going to be just the images. If you want to ignore the text and just see uh, the 290 <laughs> visual elements that are part of the book as another way of um, accessing, and from there you can go to the text. And so we'll try to build in multiple pathways um, of accessing this. And thank you, before I turn it over to this gentleman, thank you for your questions. And I wanted to follow up, too, about the support that we offer our faculty authors. Um, we have a very well-established center for digital scholarship uh, in the library. And so for decades, uh, CDS uh, has been innovating um, and really, um, um, really leading the way in digital scholarship. But the digital publishing part is new uh, for everyone. Uh, just since 2015 uh, is when we started, uh, again, with the, the generous support of the Mellon Foundation. And we were tasked with uh, rethinking uh, on a big scale scholarly publishing. So um, we have been exploring across the portfolio. And each project is different, uh, different content, of course, uh, different arguments, different methodologies. And so we provide uh, as much support as we can. We work with the authors. It's very collaborative work, uh, including the students. So there are full teams that are assembled for each project. And we, we learn a lot as we go together. So, so that's a very good question, and I think I would begin with the, the where you very much began. Uh, you know that the, the, the difference between tradition and and history. So I'm a historian, so I'm not interested in figuring out what is right or wrong Islam, because that would be the the perspective of different traditions doing it. What I want to show is that there are many different ways of thinking about Ashura, right? So it's from my perspective, it is to actually show the difference. Why does it matter differently for Shia? or Sunni, et cetera, without actually uh, providing my opinion or kind of an authoritative opinion on which one is uh, better or which one is right or not, et cetera. So in the narrative part, what I do is, um, and which obviously I wasn't covering because I was going so fast, is to actually take up, so what do the Sunni say? Like, wh why do they think? And why does it matter? And why, what the different types of Shia do, et cetera. So, it's, so the, that's where the, the deep, kind of um, uh, perspective from coming from different types of textual sources, um, from different languages, 
that it's very much a part of it. Um, that um, and the ultimately the the aim is to to be able to show that this matters. So from so if it's someone looking at it, let's say an American who doesn't know much about Islam, what I want them to get from it is not so much that there is one particular understanding that is right or wrong, but more a, a sense of how much these things actually matter. If one wants to understand Muslim societies, one has to understand why this is so crucial, why the, the past constantly intrudes upon the present. Um, and uh, so there's a, there's a joke that is told uh, about the British colonial period um, in India. So they, they were, the, the British were there and they went to an Ashura a procession on the 10th of Muharram. And um, so some, the, then they asked, well, why are these people crying and what, what is happening here? And so someone said, well, because Hussein died. And so they said, well, when did he die? Well, who is, you know, there's a murder or something? And they said, well, this happened 1,300 years ago. And it's like, why are these people crying now, right? And so what I want to be able to convey is to actually why it matters. They, these people are really crying, right? Uh, so as to how the past actually seeps into um, society, into ideas, into, into a sense of self that people have in variant ways. Any other questions? Sure. So another one that maybe um, to the work you're doing, mm -hmm. how are you getting, I, I know you have a digital um, scholarship, but how are you getting professors, academics here to become more involved? Yeah. Sounds like this has been a wonderful partnership. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, great question. Um, so there is wonderful, uh, strong interest across the campus in digital publishing. Uh, we're seeing that momentum only increase year by year. Uh, we do have a faculty advisory board uh, that reviews proposals. Uh, so um, I mentioned at the start that the initiative is, is anchored between the university library and the office of the dean of the faculty. Uh, and so every fall the dean sends out a call for expressions of interest uh, to humanities and humanistic social sciences faculty. Uh, and they then uh, send me queries, send me ideas, and we start talking about them. Um, and then we work together through the semester to develop uh, really strong proposals uh, that, that then circulate among the, the faculty board. And we make really tough decisions uh, every December because we're, we're just getting very uh, highly original um, rigorous scholarship that um, just presents these um, incredible challenges for us. I mean, for the author, certainly, to rethink ideas and arguments, and, and for the full team to think about the best digital expression of those ideas and how we can um, sort of use every project to um, sort of reinvent the wheel, if you will. I mean, we really are. Um, uh, thinking uh, for the first time about how far we can push uh, these boundaries, push these parameters. So it's very, very creative work. Uh, and I think we um, really, we fuel each other. Uh, the, the team and the authors, everyone contributes. And, uh, and so we're not seeing any shortage of interest from our faculty, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, and the, the two slides I showed that outline the portfolio, that's 11 projects now um, across disciplines, history, Italian studies, uh, modern culture and media, uh, literary arts, archaeology, uh, etc. cetera. There, there's very little um, overlap there. And uh, early career scholars to, to full um, career scholars. So it, it's wonderful to see um, the variety uh, of, of ideas and, um, and creative thinking that, that our faculty bring to us. And then, of course, with the student involvement, that there are also opportunities then to teach with the publications, so include the students in the production of them, um, but then to see the, these projects used in the classroom is, is really great and, and exciting. And we actually do rely on our students heavily for user testing. Uh, so we, we do know, um, we have a sense of, of what's working with different audiences thanks to the students.
Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, again, uh, thanks for your patience at the beginning. And please stay tuned. Uh, we will be bringing out more projects every year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.